Uh, welcome back to another episode of Overcome Become podcast. Uh, with us today, we have a special guest host, Ryan Mallo, a former competitor, um, prep coach as well, and now the promoter of the Van Dyke Classic here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Ryan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, basically you said everything for me. So yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm 41 years old. I like long uh, walks on the beach. No, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> for, for real, that, that, that's basically what it was. I've, I've been a long time, um, you know, competitive bodybuilder, now retired, uh, moved kind of into uh, coaching athletes and, and getting them ready. And then just recently, as of 2018, kind of moved into the, um, the promoting aspect of it. So everything I do is, uh, is training related. I even developed a software program that's for trainers to help them with clients too. So, you know, my entire, my entire existence right now is all based on, you know, gym training, competing, coaching, that kind of stuff. Uh, take us back to the start. I want to actually know, Ryan, um, what is it about bodybuilding? How did it start for you? How did you find the passion? What got you hooked? What was it that you were like, all right, this is it. I'm, I want to be a bodybuilder. Uh, I don't know. I guess if I go way, way back, it would start from when I was like a teenager. So then uh, my brother really was the first one because he, he was kind of always the, he's two years older than me. So I guess he, he hit that uh, stage in life where he was more self-conscious and wanted to be bigger. And, you know, you, you start getting up in the years in high school and you start to realize that the, the girls really only want to date guys who are in their twenties, you know? And there's a big difference when you look at like a 15 year old, 16 year old, and then there's like a 21, 22 year old size wise and, you know, even growth spurt. So he's the, he's the original one who, you know, we started going down into the basement, started training uh, with like iron, like, like uh, my mom's um, boyfriend at the time, he worked with like steel. So he, he actually, I think they manufactured just like big chunks of steel, like plates and we were using those things on bars and it was like we had kind of like a little a little setup in the basement with a bike and um I really didn't know what I was doing so I'd go down there we we had like a punching bag and a, uh, a little stationary bike so you just rip it and you know see how long I, I'm sure in my head I felt like I was down there forever but I'm sure it was like 10 minutes and then I got bored and went back upstairs right thinking that I was doing something so he's he's the one who originally got me going he and then from there I you know I was moving a little bit more and I started getting you know into my 16 17 uh age uh and then you know, I had two friends, uh, Tracy and Alita, they, uh, or actually, no, it was Alita and her sister. So I, I went to school with, uh, with this, uh, this friend of mine and her and her sister started going to shapes. So I'm like, Oh, cool. I'm going to come check it out. So they were the first ones and it was shapes on Pamina. So it was like when it was the only male shaped, all the other shapes were just females only. Right. So this is the only co-ed one and it was pretty kick-ass. Like, uh, it was awesome. And, you know, I started pushing and, and getting more familiar with what I needed to do. And then you start making friends, right? So you start making friends with like some of the older guys. Um, you know, I think who was one of the first ones, like Trevor Martin. Um, and there's a few other guys that I never really saw anymore. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to just shoot out some names. Maybe some of them are actually even out there. Uh, there's Corey Levine and, and these guys. So actually me and Corey, we had like a little rivalry because we were both going for the uh, the novice at the time, Kevin Monez and this type of stuff. So, you know, over the years at Shapes on Pamela, you start to kind of get used to the machines and you realize that there's more than just a, a barbell and some dumbbells and you start looking and watching around and it, it got me, it got me growing. Um, I had a training partner, Mark Saltail. He, uh, he was actually the one who introduced me to my first uh, Sustanon shot because we, we were always, we were always banging hard at the gym, but you know, we saw all these guys that were just growing so we're like, oh, okay. So I was 20 years old when I took my first, uh, my first CC of Sust and it was the Sidaho Sus. I don't know if you've ever seen those ones. It's like the, the, <laughs> it's like the Russian Sus. It was really cool. It comes in like a strip of five, maybe 10 and they're like little pop-outs and it's, it's an amp. Um, this is back then when people would actually pay $24, you know, $25 an amp. And this is what we were paying. Right. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People complain about like $80 for 10, 10 CCs. We were, <laughs> we were paying $24 for, for one CC. Um, but our doses were not as crazy because with that amount, right. We're doing one shot every five days. I literally went from 178 pounds to 225 pounds. My first real goal with, uh, with sus and, 
you know, eventually I got, I got started growing. I hit 200 pounds. I'm like, Oh crap. So I started moving with my sus shots like every second day. And then, you know, you progress. And then I wanted to compete. I saw a few other people. Um, so I can't remember what year I got kicked out of shapes, but eventually I got kicked out of shapes. I moved <laughs> to ironworks. I think almost everybody's been kicked out right. of shapes at some point. Why did, why did you get kicked out of shapes? Uh, what was the first time? I've been kicked out of there a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. What happened? I, I, the people want to know. Um, I want to know, basically. I think I got kicked out when, because I, I actually started training at Shapes on Naren when they first opened that one up. So, you know, I spent a couple of years at Pemina and then around the 2000s, I, I'm pretty sure this is when Naren opened up and I was training there. And, you know, you're trying to train hard, you're, you're, you're pushing. And I was using the pec deck, probably not training properly, right? Probably just flinging weight um, in hindsight, but I was able to use the whole stack. So I decided to take, take a pin and add some weight, you know, with a plate, right? And it just so happened that maybe probably the, um, the, the pulley or the, the cable system, you know, like you have the, the little bracket that holds it with the, um, the Allen key stuff. So that slipped out, boom, the weight comes crashing. And then the owner comes flying over because he was training, I guess, at the same time. But he, he came he came over in like just shorts and a shirt. Like he, he's an older guy. I had no idea who this dude was. <laughs> and he came over and just started, you know, laying into me. I'm like, dude, I'm like, who, who the hell are you? And he's like, I own this place. He's like, I've been watching you train. He's like, I want you out of here, you, you know. And apparently the report was I was abusive to all the other machines. But meanwhile, the only machines I was using was a barbell. Like I was just doing like either dumbbells or bench press. So I guess he just didn't like my attitude. So I got kicked out of there. Um, that was the first time I got booted. This was uh, probably at a time where I don't know how popular bodybuilding was back then. But I'm assuming that there were probably not as many really hardcore training individuals at, at such a gym. Yeah, no, not at, not at Shapes, definitely, because Shapes was like that first, you know, they had that Planet Fitness feel, right? So it was like all colorful, and they had the crazy mm -hmm. floors. It was big. It was very nice. But um, yeah, definitely all the bodybuilders were over at uh, Ironworks, right, where I ended up going after. But, you know, the only real bodybuilder in Shapes, I guess, at that time, Corey Levine, Kevin Monez, but even him, he went to Ironworks, I think. Uh, Trevor Martin. I remember Trevor Martin one time spotting me on like a front squat. That's how I like, I knew this guy. Um, but yeah, so that was my first time getting booted. The second time was later on. I snuck in with like changing my name. I used my middle name instead of my first name. And then they, uh, you know, I had a friend who kind of worked the desk and she just kind of put me in as Robert Mallow. So I kind of skewed in, but then I blew my chest out. So when I tore my chest um, in 2008, they, they had to call the ambulance. So now the ambulance comes, now they get a report. So then people gave my name and then they're like, wait a minute, this guy's not even supposed to be in here. So now I got hit with another kick out and I actually got served with papers saying, you know, I'm no longer allowed to uh, set foot on the premises. And, uh, oh yeah, like, yeah. crazy. But yeah, Ironworks, Ironworks was like the gym. Like that was the best gym, in my opinion, in the city. It was a shame that the Canada Post had to, you know, come and buy that because, you know, the guy was trying to expand and make it bigger. But for the money he was given, he shut it down. But it was it was an amazing gym. The guys like Henry, Danny, there is like even Sean Wolf and uh, man, who else? Oh, Kevin oh, wait, Monez was on. there. You, you come from a time when it was uh, Danny Lawson and uh, Wolfie, right? Oh, they bodybuilder. Oh, okay. yeah. Like me and Danny, I've been friends with Danny since uh, I was like 20, 20 or 21. Years. I've been friends with him 20 years now. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Sure. For sure. Since I was 21. Yeah. For, I've known for, him. He was a former Mr. Manitoba, right? Yeah. 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 Actually, wow. I, co I coached him for when he won the Manitobas. Really? And actually, not a lot of people know this, but Ryan coached me as well at one point. This was back in 2014, I think. Yeah, I can't remember which show. It was Nationals. What did we do? We only did like a three. We did an off season. And then um, I hired a coach for a prep for 2015. Uh, things didn't really go that well with that coach. Let's just put it that way. And I reached out to you. Basically, it was like a little bit of a prep safe. And I think I reached out to you like 10 days out, freaking out. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't very much time. Yet. No, no. It was, and it was, uh, it was Provincials. Provincials 2015. Uh, yeah, you picked me for that one. It was uh, I was very thankful because I had nowhere really to go. I didn't really know a lot of, I didn't really have a lot of options, but you were kind enough to take me under your yeah, wing I was again. The, <laughs> I was the last resort. Oh, shit, this guy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's funny. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you know what though? I love the sport. So I don't really, you know, even, even when I coach my people, like now where I'm kind of going all over the place. So you, you were trying to ask about me at the beginning of body business, but just coaching people. I do it cause I love it. You know, uh, anybody who knows me, I put in, I put in the hours, I put in the time and I don't ask a lot. Actually, I'm probably the cheapest coach that anybody would ever have heard of. Um, but you know, it's, it's just for, it's just for, for doing it just for the sake of like watching people progress. And at times, you know, almost every year I'm like, ah, crap, I'm never doing this again. I'm going to quit. But, That's uh, very interesting too, because at times I, um, you know, with my coaching services, there's always um, moments in which I, I'm well aware that let's say perhaps a client is not able to afford the entire coaching fee or whether it's that or the posing or, or training. And we as coaches, of course, we always have the ability to make the decision whether we want to charge for these services or not sometimes, um, especially if we see that, a, that, a, that an individual is very passionate and motivated and whatever, right? So I'm, I'm also in the same type of, of the same type of mentality of, you know, I do at the end of the day, do what I do because I love it. It, it is a business, of course. But at the end of the day, I do it out of the pride of helping someone else. Yeah, yeah, that's that's basically it. It's it's nice to see that and whatever. It's it, it's awesome when you get the um, get the uh, I guess acknowledgement. But you know, more people than not will will voice their opinion if you if they don't like you or if you suck or if they feel that, that you've done them wrong versus the people who actually feel that you've done them some sort of justice it's, it's like anything you know there's really no positive feedback but negative feedback oh you'll get that right away so you can have negative feedback in anything you do though in life whether it's bodybuilding a business or whatever it's just it's going to come with it right but yeah, but uh I was gonna say you guys are you guys are impacting people in a very positive manner. I find nine times out of ten, the people that give a negative response are people that either wanted way too much attention or didn't put the effort into actually executing it what they were supposed to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So or weren't they... doing it for the right reasons too. Um, or, yeah, that. Some, or or had no idea of what they were getting themselves into. Because I mean, I think a lot of people that start prepping for the first show they have an, a general idea of what it entails but in reality they really don't have that solid of an idea of how hard this actually is because you have to be on point 24 7 right so yeah yeah definitely hey do you guys hear me like filling with my mic here i'm hearing some static so i'm just trying to adjust my wire it's sounding better now there was a little bit of static up for the first little bit yeah oh, it sounded no. like there, did you still hear the static or no no okay no that's, that's good now yeah my mic well, I, I, at first it was though at first it was um okay I, I was actually i was actually curious what led you to the to your first competition like what made you actually want to step on stage and who coached you or did you coach yourself uh i basically for that there was a little bit of help from uh from a few people but yeah i kind of just uh, my internet are you guys still seeing me or no we're seeing you yeah Okay, cool. I'm getting all these weird messages like, hey, your internet connection is crap. Um, <laughs> yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome to my world in Maskush. Um, yeah, so I, I basically did my own stuff. Like this, this is the thing. And, and I talk to a lot of bodybuilders now, and there's no excuse for not looking good in today's in today's time, right? The amount of resources you have and the fact that you can just pick up a computer or even your phone, like Google, boom, you have everything, YouTube, you have everything. I was even explaining to my daughter, I'm like, oh, daddy never had Google. I didn't have a computer. Like I didn't even own a computer until I was almost 20, how old was I? 25 was my first ever computer, right? That's 2005. That's probably late in the game anyways for the normal person. I wasn't a gamer. So that was the first time I actually owned a computer and I didn't even know what the hell to do with the damn thing. I, I opened it up and like, okay, well, what can I do with this? And I didn't know you had to install Microsoft like office and all this junk. And I'm like, God, this computer's crap. I can't do nothing. Do you rely on, on the good old flex magazines and such for, you know, your sources of information for bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck this, this thing. Hold on. I'm trying to get this mic to not go that yeah definitely uh those magazines like i think at one point when you asked me the question the first thing that popped in my head it's like what made me want to be a bodybuilder was a picture in a flex magazine of chris cormier i can still see it i don't know if you guys have ever seen it i'm i'm old right so but it would have been probably around like 98 maybe 97 meh, 99 is a picture of chris cormier he's sitting on a bench he's in his overalls 
with no shirt. So it's just sitting there like all beef in his blue overalls. And right there, I'm like, oh man, that's the craziest. Like that's a wicked picture. And in my head, I'm like, my goal is to do a photo shoot and overalls and just be like big and sit there. Right. And in hindsight, if I'm sure if I would have done it, I would look like such a tool, like a farmer or a little <laughs> straw. <in my> <laughs> okay. But that's, that's what drove me. Right. That's what, that's what made me want to go. And then, like I said, you see, you saw a few people, actually one of the people that I, that, um that i saw at pemina was rick wilson i don't know if you you know who he is we called him the purple guy because he he uh and he's gonna watch this maybe because I, I still talk to him once in a while but we called him the purple guy because he was so tanned I, I think his parents or his dad or somebody owned a tanning comp this is what i heard right they owned a tanning salon and man this dude was always tanning and he had like the craziest back and I remember one day I asked him, I'm like, what the hell do you do for your back? And he kind of explained me his back workout. And then from that point on, I was determined to have like a wicked back, right? And it was even really cool because later on down the years, he came to me. He's like, man, I remember you asked me how to train back. He's like, shit. He's like, you really, really you really grew your back, right? So that, that was pretty cool um, to watch these guys and, and this kind of stuff. And What was the heaviest you ever competed or stepped on stage at? We talk, oh, okay, we're talking stepped on stage. Um, I guess, yeah, my heaviest, I'm still pissing around with this mic. Um, my heaviest would have been 240, and that would have been in 2011. So, so that would be, was, was that at a national show? Or was that, yeah, that's actually, like, that was, that was a Canadian, Canadian nationals yeah. in Montreal, yeah, 2011. That was my last one before I retired. The very first time that I actually, knew heard or saw you was at my very first provincials here in manitoba 2010 i believe it was you were going right against mike silstra ah uh, yeah i bombed that one because i came off the show two weeks before that or i think a week before i think a week before that where i did the muscle mayhem in kansas city and i won the overall there and then um in this instance, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't getting the feedback I wanted right away from my coach. So there was a delay and then, you know, things just didn't work out for the second show. So I, I, I missed my, I missed my fill up. I miss, I was holding water. I look soft. So, you know, there's, I mean, there's a few issues with that one. Yeah. You, I mean, from my own perspective, I'm, this was the second show I ever did. I'm still uh, competing at like 160, maybe. I was like in the middle of, of welterweight. Then I go watch my, my first provincial show. And I see these two huge motherfuckers. Mike Silstra probably weighing at around 235, I think, something like that. And then you probably weighed around the same. And I was just in awe. Like that was my very first massive monster guy experience in person. Because obviously you see the guys in the internet, in the magazines, whatever. But I was just like, what does it take to get that big? And I was still new in the, in the in the industry and competing and it was a great show i don't know how close it was or whether it was close but what i took away from that was definitely motivation for me for my next shows for the following years what's that sorry my mic kicked out on me my headphones i don't know what it is with these damn headphones did you ask me a question <laughs> no no I <laughs> i'm just standing here waiting for some fire. i see you answer and then all of a sudden i click my headphones in and it's like pause i'm like Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> I missed something. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Basically, I, I was uh, commending your... Yay, your, thank you. you know, thanks for the thanks for the props. But yeah, I, I remember that show. And it, it was, you know, I, I was always that guy lacking on legs. And I'll be honest, I, I you know, there were some years where I would train legs awesome. And I think one of my biggest downfalls is I didn't, I didn't stretch like I should have, right? There's a, there's a lot of things that I know now that I didn't know back then. Um, you know definitely a lot of health stuff uh, but stretching i learned i learned a lot you know and just just moving through i've made a lot of mistakes so I, as a coach i try to prevent as many people as i can from making these mistakes but you know it's 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 just a cycle of life it's like me as a, as a 20 year old everyone coming in hey you can't do this you're gonna fizzle out nah, yeah 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 i don't care if I die, as long as I look big in my casket, you know, like man, that, is that was the, the, the saying back then. Yeah, that, that was I one was, of the stupidest things. A big fucking box. And that was like, like the hardcore mentality back then. What would you say are the main differences in how people think, in your opinion, from back then when you started competing and when you even from the moment you retired to now, you know, the current new with the new divisions, 
you know, what, what are the main differences that you've spotted in the industry, whether it's uh, the physique, the looks or the mentality that you can, that you can share with us? Okay, for sure. For sure. The mentality is still there because I still talk to people and they don't care if they die. Um, you know, some of them, some of them do like the, the smart ones are actually watching, but, but like I said, now with, with all the information, like I learned how to pose off a of VHS, a VHS tape. You know, I don't know if I sent you it, but it's actually Gary Udit teaching. <laughs> I sent it to wow. Gary. I'm like, yo, is this you? He's like, yeah. He's like, holy crap. That's a long time. That's from like back in 1998 or I bought it at Myers Drugs at the time. That's so pretty that's, cool, actually. That's how, that's how I learned. Yeah. I'll dig it out one day and I'll uh, take a picture. But, um, you know, the, the information era is like now. So there, like I said, there is no excuse, but the mentality is still there. People are still doing you know, crazy amounts. And I was, I, I was guilty as for sure. And I still hold that reputation where everyone's like, Oh yeah, Ryan, but he, he don't puts everybody on crazy high doses and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. When I was, when I was in my heyday and going bananas and stuff like this, yeah, the doses were extremely high. I even worked with Chad Nichols and he, he, he freaked out. He's like, dude, he's like, you're taking way more than Ronnie. Cause like we, we shared like Ronnie was still with Chad at the time. I guess he was coming off his retirement, but he's, they still spoke. So he's like, when Ronnie was getting ready for the Olympia, he's like, he never even came close to this. He's like, I don't even know how to, how, how to do anything now with you because you're so, you're so off the deep end. Right. So, you know, um, but nowadays with all that info, with the ability to go to doctors and the, the ability to kind of do your research. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of retarded research on the internet too. So you got to be smart. Like a 10 year old kid can get on there and write whatever he wants or some retard who's like, uh, you know, all this and believes this way is going to get on there and say what he wants to say. And then you're going to get the other extremist who's going to say what he wants to say or she wants to say, it doesn't really matter. Right. So it's kind of sifting through the garbage and, the one, uh, the, the only real difference that I see is because of so much information being out there, the confusion and the marketing and the, bull, you know, I'll say it, the bullshit that's out there is like just compounding. Bodybuilding has not changed since the beginning of time, since, since the beginning of competing, like it's just maybe increased and you've had more, um, more knowledge on like food or even more access to food, right? More money. So now you can spend money on stuff and you have maybe a few extra drugs, but now all these exotic drugs where you're mixing five different types of trend with a, a sip and a probe and a this and ah man, dude, for real, take your trend shot, take your sip shot. Don't bother buying a product that has the two of them mixed together because you're not getting what it says it's in there anyways. It's, Do you uh, think they come up with these new drugs just to kind of get the people that are impressionable or just to try to draw attention is, Oh, this is the new best thing that you can get. You're going to get super big. Do you think they're almost like taking advantage of people, uh, people's beliefs and impressionability? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Here, hold on. Cause I'm still having issues with when you guys talk. So my headphones are crap here. I'm just going to see if I can switch it to my, um, the computer. Two hours later. Now, there you go. Yeah, you, there you, we go. Fuck it. I bought this, I bought this mic, but for some reason, I don't know if there's an issue with the headphone jack or if my headphone jack is just shit. No clue. No clue. But that's it's not that's way better. That's 100. You guys Honestly, hear me? I tried to be pro and I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy this. And I had it actually last time for that uh, podcast with the other people. And um, it was working. We're good now. Yeah, that's we're good. We're good. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out and see. Let's... Okay, cool. What was this no, joke for? Oh, we were just talking about how we can make a perfect meme out of you. Like if we were to ask you a question you're, and you were sitting there with a blank face, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah you guys can do it. Um, okay, what were we talking about? Sorry, guys. I lost my train of thought. Um, Let's see. Yeah. It's like never having Ryan on this shit again. Well, okay, so <laughs> uh, basically, if, if I... Oh, yeah, we were, we were talking about what changed in bodybuilding. If you guys still I was, want to talk I was about actually it. going to build up on a couple of things that you mentioned along the way, you know, when you were explaining your bodybuilding career and whatnot one of them was the whole rivalry that you got with we had with uh you had with this one other guy um do you think that mentality of having like a friendly rivalry is is good in bodybuilding what like for, for, for yourself do you think that help you become a better person because uh, there's a lot of people that almost see that negatively because they are too much of the belief that i should only focus on myself 
but then there's people that are realistic and, and, and realize, hey, it is a competition. So just focusing on yourself might not cut it. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I guess it depends. I don't know. Rivalry is pretty cool because he, you know, we always would like bug each other and we push each other in the gym and that kind of stuff. Never really trained together. There was a few times where like he would kind of be around and we would just shoot the shit. He used to bug me because he, uh, it was like, um, it was Corey Levine who was the the rivalry at that time for the, for the first show, I guess. And then, uh, yeah, he was always bugging me because he had, he had really good calves. He was a short dude. I think, I don't know. He was like five, six, maybe five, five. So me, I was like almost six feet. So I joke with him. He's like, oh, dad, look at your calves. And I'm like, dude, I'm like from the, from the height, from my knee down to my ankles, the size of your leg. I'm like, no wonder you have like short or like huge little calves. I'm like, you know, so there's things like this. It was kind of fun. And in the end, everybody is friends. I don't think I've really had any, never really been a time where I've gotten into like a major argument with anybody or there's been any real issues um, with, with anything that's kind of happened in, um, in competing, uh, not offhand. I don't know. So what was your, what was, what was the highlight of your bodybuilding career? Like what was your, in your opinion, your best showing, whether you took first or an overall or whatever place in? Uh, well, the best feeling was when I won, I finally won my overall. Um, it was frustrating back in 2005 when, you know, I competed against Trevor Martin, you know, my, my, again, these are things like the condition I had back then. I'm, I look back, I'm like, holy crap, I was soft. I was never coming in like dry. What the hell was, it? you know, but back then it, people, it was in an era where every, you're kind of in between. It was like a really kind of weird era. I don't know. I didn't really, you don't really, you see a few people who are like rock solid, but then most people who are winning shows didn't really have a great condition to begin with. So um, that year I lost to Trevor Martin by one point. But it was actually the year that they they let him compete. But he was a former Mr. Manitoba already. So he in matter of rules, he actually shouldn't have even been on stage. So he shouldn't have been there. And, um, you know, I always heard stories and, and I talked to a few judges. I won't, I won't say names, but I know even just some people who are even sitting beside the judges and stuff like that. There was a there was an incident where one of the judges wanted to put Trevor Martin fifth and Debbie Karpanko made a comment now if she hears this i don't know whatever but this is what i heard made a comment to the judge say no it's like are you serious you're putting trevor fifth and they're like yeah i don't, didn't like his shape he's kind of blocky and whatever and she's like no you changed this he's a national level competitor and which actually shouldn't even have been on stage to begin with and you know i lost it i was it was the one show where they judged the morning and then they also judged the nighttime in the morning i had a unanimous win at nighttime i lost so I'm like, uh, what happened? You know, why did all of a sudden it flip? Because I was winning in the morning. Like I was, and this was a big show. There was, we actually, this is a show where there was like um, Rob IQ, There was like Rick Wilson. There was Blair. There is, I don't even know if Kevin Menez was up there, but there was, we had, we had like 15 guys because there was no super heavyweight. So we, we were all in heavyweights. It was a huge class. And that was a big disappointment to, to lose that one. And I don't really know what would have happened past that. Maybe I would have killed myself sooner. I'm not sure. Just based on like being able to get to the higher ranks. But, um, you know, not getting that Manitoba qualification where you have a lifetime buy into the nationals. I was still competing in 2010 to try to win that overall. So I was still doing the regional shows. So in 2005, I had to compete. 2006, I competed. Uh, 2007, I took off due to um, that heart issue that you're talking about. At <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, and then 2008, I came back. I competed, and then I think I went to the nationals. 2009, I took off. 2010. You know, so the best experience, I not, see here, I'm rambling. No one wants to hear this crap. Best experience was when I won the overall at Muscle Mayhem. Um, my best showing, I would say, was my 2011. And to be honest, I, I feel I should have been in that, at least in the top three. I came fourth. Um, there is uh, Mike Johnson, who, who won, and Antoine and Jerome Bravo. They tied for second and left me in fourth. So, you know, that was a, that was a tough show. Cause I didn't even get on, I didn't even step on stage at finals till almost 12 o'clock at night. So it, it was a big show. And I think after my show that year, I think they started switching the, um, 
the women and the men differently because it was just it was too long yeah out of curiosity sorry i was gonna say the antoine that you mentioned is that antoine valion antoine valion yeah yeah basically the three people who beat me they all they're all pros mike johnson turned pro with that show antoine turned turned pro i think one or two years later and um jerome bravo turned pro in 2014 yeah yeah so i think it was like boom 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 is it that's how that's, it, a, that's impressive though you're like right there with them yeah again i i think i i for sure uh, i know if i would have been healthy i would have eventually been a pro whether i would have been an awesome pro probably not um but uh yeah it was only a matter of time to before i got there because for real in 2011 sitting at 240 my off season <clears throat> my off seasons that were getting closer to like the 301 so, you know, I was putting on a little bit too much fat to take it there. But if I would have continued this route for another couple more years, I'm sure I would have been able to push my stage weight into like the, the 250s or something. But again, you know, due to health problems and just stupidity leading into this. Uh, what were the main health implications that you experienced getting that heavy, uh, whether it was in prep or during your off season? I mean, 301, that is, I can't fathom. Uh, what that would feel like you know I'm- oh, it sounds it sounds like fun but man it was it was crazy like that was that was a year like chad chad helped me get to that um to that point um it was a mixture between you know heavy eating for real i was non-stop eating like my meals were 15 ounces of like potato or two and something cups of rice with 12 ounces of meat. And it was just non nonstop, nonstop. And then just to push weight, I was having like a little bit of ice cream for breakfast. I was eating, you know, every couple of days I was having like a double cheeseburger and fries and it sounds like fun, but for real, it sucked. And then when, um, when Chad would give me a cheat, I would actually convince him to just let me not eat. So I said, instead of doing a cheat day, can I just have a day where I eat a little bit of food and just not eat anything, you know, because I I was tired of eating. It was even to the point where I was eating. I think I was eating almost 11 meals a day um, with snacks, pre-workout, post-workout shakes. It was just retarded. And then I was like puking in my sleep, you know, I was like, ah, too much food. So it, it pushed a lot. Now, I'm not saying that that was the right way. And maybe there was just lack of communication between me and Chad and on how I was feeling and this kind of stuff. But I just, I just buckled down. Right. I'm sure if he would have known I was puking in my sleep, there would have been a, you know, he would have changed my diet definitely and would have lowered some foods or maybe took away some stuff later on at night, but I just kept pushing and I was growing. So he's like, okay, cool. We're, we're good to go. So this was a time actually when I was my biggest, I was um, living I was living with uh, Kathy LeFrancois and Hide Tara in um, El Monte, so just outside of um, Los Angeles. So I was training every day in Venice with uh, Charles Glass. Um, I'd go and train at the Coliseum where Milos had his gym. And me and Hide would, would train. Oh, man, like this dude, he, his, his endurance is retarded because Milos makes you train like a, a maniac. Um, it's nothing but like giant sets. I couldn't even, I, I did two sets and I couldn't even keep up. So this, you know, it's pretty cool, but I lived the life. Like not a lot of people know about it. There's a few people I tell, but you know, I've spent my time living in California. You know, there was times where like, I don't know if you know, Kathy LeFrancois, but that's Lee Priest, ex, uh, ex-wife, uh, Hide Kata is the Japanese bodybuilder. And you know, there's normal days where like Iris Kyle would come over to the house and we lived that's in so like cool. a, it was like a two point some million dollar mansion because, uh, you know, um, Kathy's boyfriend at the time, um, Scott, his he, he they owned like a whole bunch of land and stuff. So they had a gym in the basement. It was insane. They had an elevator in the house. Like <laughs> it was crazy. We all we all had our own room. Right. I had my own room with a bathroom. I had my own fridge, kept my GH Jesus. in the fridge. I'm like, Ooh, this is awesome. You know, we had a bed. Can, can I interject before you keep going? Just That's for right. people who don't know who exactly you're talking about. You're talking about like Chad Nichols is your coach, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually I actually got to Chad Nichols when I met Ronnie Coleman at Popeyes in 2008, and uh, I was talking with him, and then he, I don't know, I took a picture, and I was pretty close. Like he's bigger than me for sure, for sure. But I was impressed. I'm like, yeah, that's not bad, right? But um, yeah, he sent me to his trainer. So then Chad, and Chad and me hooked up. Okay, and then he did he did Tara Yamaguchi that he was an Arnold Classic winner, correct? Uh, I think he was. Yeah. And you know, he, he did even the Arnold or he did the Olympia this year. Didn't, didn't, you know, his showing wasn't the greatest, but he's been competing like crazy. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to rifle these off because a lot of people don't yeah. know. Like uh, 
Iris yeah. Kyle had the most Olympia wins for women's bodybuilding. Hide Tata yeah. was Iris Kyle's boyfriend, I believe, for the longest time. Arnold Classic winner, only one. From no, Japan, I don't. Think, I think. No, they're just friends. They never dated. Really? No, no, no. Now they own Body Cafe, but no, I believe is is he because Hide Tata had a wife in uh, Japan and that kind of oh. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, pretty sure I saw it on Generation Iron that they were together, but no, (laughs) no, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe I, 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 at the time I was living there and stuff, I never saw any indication of that, but you know, and then there's Kathy, right? So Kathy, she competed as well. She was a women's bodybuilding Olympia. So that's crazy. She won the New York pro. So yeah, I've, I've lived it. I've, I've bumped in and I've seen these people and had a chance to like see how they live. And I've even spent some time with, um, sorry, my son's running around here. King, are you okay? King, you good? Anyway, I'm sure he's good. Um, so yeah, I even spent some time with like Dennis James and, uh, and stuff like that. So that's so impressive, honestly, man. Like I, just hearing all this for me is like, it's crazy because I look up to a lot of these people that you're mentioning, right? So hearing that you got to spend one-on-one time with them, trainer Pete Tata, uh, be in Milos's gym, like fucking wild. Yeah, Anyways. Charles Charles Glass too, if you oh, know him. Charles Glass too, of course, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, these are all awesome guys. Like they have yeah. awesome personalities, super kind, super humble. And um, probably one of the coolest moments out uh, in, in his, it was the best is like, I, I, again, I'm, I'm training at Gold's Venice. Um, 301, I just hit it. I remember hitting it. I'm like, yeah, I'm training with Charles Glass. And to have people come up and introduce themselves to me, like Silvio Samuel, I don't know if you know who he is. He, he And he's a nice guy. I love him because he's a nice Christian dude. Um, but he came up to me. We were training calves. He's like, hey, he's like, uh, I'm Silvio. He's like, uh, what show are you doing? Who, You know, because when you're a big guy and you're running around with Charles Glass, they think you're somebody, right? It turned out I was like really nobody. I was just trying to you know, I had some money, so I was able to pay my way into the group, but it, it was really cool to have him come up, him tell me who, who he was, and then wanted to see if he can come and train with us and do calves. And yeah, it, it was, it was awesome. And I, you know, at the time, at the time I could probably say that I was one of the biggest guys in that gym, you know, uh, at, at six feet, three one, like sure there's bigger dudes and, you know, but, um, I felt pretty good. It was awesome. It was, it was a, it was a trip. So I out of all back. the the people you train with, is there one that you would feel that you subscribe to their methods a little bit more than others that that made more sense to you or that you stuck with for a little bit more? Uh, you know what? I take something from everybody because uh, I also work with Chris Aceto too. So I spent a year and a half with Chris Aceto. Um, you know when when I look back, I kind of I kind of take knowledge from from every single one. I look at different methods. Um, everybody has their own selling point, right? You know, you got Neil Hill with his Y3T or YT3 or whatever it is. You got uh, Ben Pakowski with his M140. And then, um, you know, at, at one point, Dennis, when I was with him, he was really pushing this time under tension, like very, very slow. So, you know, I, I learned some stuff from that. I wasn't a fan of that one, though. And, you know, me and him, we spoke afterwards and then we kind of adjusted things based on that. But um, I don't know. I guess I just kind of mix things of what I like and what I see and what makes sense and try to keep things as simple. Um, what I said at the beginning when you when you're asking me what's happening now is everybody's just trying to become something or reinvent something. and you know, I like to post Lee Priest actually put on maybe a couple couple weeks ago, maybe. And he was like, he's like, I, I was self, self-trained, self self-taught, no gurus. He's like, I did it. He's like, it's simple. He's like, and I'll show you how and you'll do it yourself. Right. And, and I kind of like that, that mentality because it's taking away from all these, um, these like gimmicks. You know, when you when you buy it, it's like the magazines when I when I was young, watching reading the magazines, they're filled with just a bunch of things to distract you, to push you this way, to push you. When in reality, there is no right answer, and it's just you know, see what works, continue to push this way. Uh, like what Arnold said, he used to train the same basic way his entire career almost, and you know, there there's there's kind of validation behind that. 
right? So don't, don't get things too complicated. I've worked with clients who, who would actually ask for like specifics and you can see in their head as you're talking to them, their wheels are going. I'm like, dude, you're already complicating everything. I'm like, just push. I'm like, just push, but make sure you squeeze. But it's, it's a, it's a process. The one thing I really kind of like about, um, about Dennis is with the fact of it's like this whole really, really slow rep is the fact that you're, you're learning how to drive the muscle. And I use the analogy of uh, a standard car. You don't jump from first gear to fourth gear to, to like overdrive or whatever it is. You got to go from one to two to three to four to five. And when he gets you to go to the bottom of a, of a, like, let's just say leg press, he gets you to kind of sit in that hole. He won't let you just shoot up which means you've skipped like one and two gear. So he actually made me just start and without a bounce, you had to just start moving, right? So you've used your first gear. Now you go into your second gear. Now you go into your third, now your fourth and your fifth. And then you come back down. It's good because it's going to teach you this method, but I don't feel you can really grow this way. Everyone science is going to, oh, I yeah, time on attention. Screw it. Time on attention, but you, you're not getting a pump. Yeah, you're, you're, you're stressing out your nervous system. Sure. In my opinion, you would be better off to take that, learn how to go from one to 10 and actually do that movement like one, two, without the bounce, right? Without skipping those gears, because if you can hit every gear and you can do it efficiently, you're actually going to grow. And I tell everybody, look at, look at people who have awesome legs. Have you ever seen them squat? They don't go down, come up and be like, one, Two, no, they, they're like, bang, bang, bang. And you watch like anybody with a massive chest. What do they do? It's, it's, it's a piston. They drive it. It's constant because they've learned how to use their gears from one to 10. So efficiently, they make it look like they're just throwing weight, but they're not. They're actually using the muscle to drive their weight from one to 10. Same with shoulders. Um, and this is something that I learned later on and, you know, these are reasons why, like I have a torn chest now. Um, I'm, I'm stiff. I didn't focus on stretching. So, you know, now I actually have the, the benefit of teaching some of the athletes that ha how to actually do this. I'm, I'm a bigger believer in, um, what is it called? Um, there's activation and then there's, um, tension. So I learned, and actually Ben Pekowski is huge on this one. And I learned this from uh, Paul Carter. I don't know if you know who he is. He's like T1 Nation, I think is his, his uh, group. He, he's, um, he's like a powerlifting coach and he, he okay. kind of goes into bodybuilding, but he talks over like tension, tension over activation. And I'm a bigger believer in that than anything else. So that's kind of what I focus on. I don't know. Yeah, I think a lot of people tend to, overcomplicate things and you'll see a lot of people really focusing more on what's the next best supplement or the next best drug or whatever the case may be when in reality they haven't even mastered the basics they haven't even mastered their own body awareness they haven't mastered you know the training the, the nutrition the real base of bodybuilding they're, they're they're thinking a little bit too ahead um when it comes to these things and and that is not no way of consistently improving if you don't have your base and then you just focus on these things First of all, you're going to be wasting your money. You're not really taking fully adva full advantage of what it could be when you get to a point when you're ready. So, yeah, I completely agree with a lot of the points that you're that you're saying right now. Yeah, yeah, and I, and and when it comes down to coaching, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough goal because there's there's a there's a place for every style of coach, right? You got your coaches who teach the amateurs, then you got your coaches who work with like the pros. And they almost kind of need each other um, because the amateurs, we, somebody has to teach them the basic stuff because pro coaches, they don't have time and they won't, they won't teach you this and they're going to basically send you on your own. So, but the thing is, is pro coaches, they get all the glory, right? They get the, they get the, the athletes when they're finally basically almost ready. They're at the top and they, and they just needed that little bit of, uh, extra motivation, you know, there's, there's some athletes that, you know, you could take, you can give them to a monkey and, you know, One monkey will train. <laughs> they, they have genetics, right? It's not the coach, but th there's something about these pro coaches, you know, they have the prestige, they've worked with enough and, and I'm not taking anything away from, from them because they, they do their job. 
but they do their job in a different way, right? Because they have different things that they have to manipulate. They're more concerned about the perfection aspect. Whereas uh, amateur coach, man, it's a big job. And I tell my athletes, because some of them are like, well, you know, they feel like you're holding out on them. And rightly so, almost every amateur coach has to, because if I come to an amateur who's just trying to do their first show and I tell them everything that needs to be done, they'll quit. There's no way. And it almost becomes like you're, you're there as a emotional support. You're just kind of giving them the drive to get on stage so that they can learn what competing is all about. And so that they can actually see where they're at and you learn to see which clients you can and cannot push. Um, but you know, as amateurs, when they're still learning how to pose properly, um, the pros already understand that and maybe just need a tweaking when amateurs are still trying to understand how come morning cardio is so important. The pros have been doing it for X amount of years and it becomes second nature when amateurs are still trying to figure out what time they're going to eat. And, um, can I switch this for this? The pros are just like, this is what I have to eat. I have to eat at this time. And they, they make their life fit around this. So there's a big difference in between who, who is a, who's a pro and who's an amateur and which amateurs will go. Uh, Rich Piano always said it. And the number one thing you need in this sport is money. And I, and I agree. If you can't afford the food you need, if you can't afford the drugs you need, because you do need some, unless you're doing natural, but even then you're going to need the time to train, right? So money plays a factor. Do you have to work a 16 hour job, a 16 hour a day job? Do you have to go to work for overtime? Do you need to pay your bills? Because some of these people who you're going to compete against have sugar daddies or who are just rich and they don't go to work at all. And they work twice. They worked out twice today and they did their cardio twice. So that's four times they spent doing something gym related or workout related. And you, as somebody who's working 12 hour shifts and who tells me, well, my boss won't let me take a, a break to eat my meal quick while well, you're screwed already. So, you know, <laughs> you turn around and you tell your athlete that that's demotivating. They're going to freak when they, when they figure out how many, like I used to quit jobs. I need to eat. Can't I'm out. Peace. You know, I used to pick my jobs, not to make crap loads of money, but just to make what I needed. But the number one thing, can I eat? Am I allowed to take a break when I need to take a break? Because I have to eat every two hours. It's not a huge meal, but I just need 15 minutes. And if the boss was okay with that, cool. If he wasn't, eh, the job's not for me. And I would yeah, leave. It's, it's very interesting how in order for someone to get to the top of the top, there's so many factors that need to be in place at the same time because yes you need the genetics you need the intensity in the training you need some knowledge you need some motivation but at the same time as you're as you're mentioning if you don't have the time or the money to really exploit these other factors it's just you will get to a certain point but you that progress or that level will stall and you will be beaten by the people that have that plus the time and the money right so it, that's what a lot of people don't realize. They they think, you know, there's certain ways of uh, of working around to a certain degree certain obstacles, but then again, when you go against someone that is in a very similar situation as you, but has the time and the money, it's just not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. There's other factors too. You know, family. You get some bodybuilders who have families who can make it work. Um, I'd like, I'd really like to have a conversation with Dexter Jackson. Cause he's the guy who's been in this the longest man, the stories he, he could probably share and the, uh, the amount of sacrifices his family probably had to make in order for him to be where he's at, you know, like, uh, I think he's a, he's a top bodybuilder, whether or not he only won the one Mr. Olympia, he, he won the most shows in history. He's been the one athlete that seemed to defy, um, you know, age and keep competing at a high level and placing like, um, like crazy high, even at like the Olympia stage, um, even into his fifties and stuff like this. So, you know, I'd be curious also to see where his health is at and how his approach, because you're going to see a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff. It's probably, probably in the next like little bit with, um, with illnesses and, and injuries and, you know, everyone watched, I'm sure Ronnie Coleman, you, you see what he gave up, um, to be Mr. Olympia. And he'll always say, I'm sure it was, every, I'd do it all again, but deep down, I know being a Christian man, he would never do that again. 
um, because God will always find another way for you to make money. And even though this was his way to make money, he's got these little kids that he's now got a, you know, the, the stress I'm sure on his wife and the stress I'm sure he feels that you, you got, you can't, you got to be able to take care of this. And that was, that was a big factor in me deciding to like retire is I got to, I got to see some close friends with like health, uh, health issues. And then like, well, okay, that's going to be me if I don't watch what I'm doing. And so I'm like, okay, screw this. And I think as a sport, if enough bodybuilders would start coming forward and saying, Hey, listen, this is where I'm at. Um, this is what happened to me. Don't make the same mistake. Maybe not all. Cause some would be like, ah, that's you and whatever. I'm good. And that this and this, but I'm sure that you, you know, you would save a few. Um, would it be good for the sport? Maybe not initially. Um, but eventually you would see a whole new breed of athletes coming through where safety becomes a big, uh, you know, a big concern. Uh, I don't so, know. So, so, so let me ask you then, Ryan, yourself being someone who's seasoned, who's used a ton of gear, obviously over the years, uh, GH and insulin, what is your advice to the younger generation? Like the guys listening to this right now are the people that are out of tall. Some of them have done their first prep or multiple going into the next season of competing. What's your advice to them to keep themselves safe or at least aware? Like what's something that they should look into? Well, you know, the rumors of having to go crazy into like mass amounts of gear, you know, there's a time and a place and depends on the body and depends on how your, your, your body's going to react. So the number one thing is definitely blood work. Like, I'm not sure if a lot of coaches are pushing for blood work, but I push my athletes to have blood work almost every two, three months. I never trust what they say. So I always ask for the paper. I say, I want to see it. So you ask your doctor, you want a copy and I want a copy of it because there's certain aspects of these things where doctors kind of sit back and be like, man, you're okay, but they don't care. You're like, you're, you're not their main concern. It's not like you're their child or anything. So they're kind of looking at things and be like, well, whatever, it's okay. Okay, good. You know, but some stuff needs to be fixed. Uh, example, if you've been off for three months and I tell you, Hey, I need you to um, go get your blood work. And we, you know, the three months before this, we just did a massive cycle. Everything was crazy. Um, and now after three months, your markers are still a little bit high. And the doctor's like, it's a little bit high, but it's not bad. And we're about to get ready for a show. Shit's about to hit the fan. And I can tell you right away that just, you know, you either need to be perfect before we start or you need more time until you, you get your markers down to where you can. And if that means you have to postpone a show, well, then so be it. And one of the one of the greatest guys about being honest is Fuad. And Fuad was really open about it. He said, hey, my markers are no good. I'm postponing and off, you know, I'm going to wait a little bit. So, you know, I was really happy that somebody like him with his amount of reach was being open and talking about blood work because not a lot of people do. Um, not a lot of coaches ask for blood work. I'm huge on this kind of stuff. So if you're a new athlete getting going blood work, number one, number two, you'd be surprised on what a lower amount of test and adding a little bit of proviron will do instead of jacking your test up through the roof. So this is a safer route. Um, I'm a huge believer in proviron mixing with testosterone to allow a smaller dose of tests. So you don't have to go you know, into like the thousands or two thousands, you know, you'll, you'll get a better result if you're using 750 milligrams of test and say 50 milligrams or even 75 milligrams of proviron, um, because the two work really well together at opening up your free tests and allows your body to react better to this. In my opinion, right. I don't know if everybody shares the same stuff, but, um, yeah, you know, watching your kidneys, watching your liver. If you think about your body in a sense that, um, think of it as a car, right? When one of these markers are offset, it's a check engine light. Now the check engine light can mean a million different things in, in your car. So you need to research and you, you need to find out why. Now, if you're about to go race this car and you check engine light when it goes on and you think that you're going to race this quarter mile and your car is going to run at hundred percent efficiency, you're stupid. Somewhere down the line, it's going to break, break down, or you're going to cause more damage. And then something is going to transfer into another organ or uh, another part of the car. If we're using that analogy. <clears throat> so, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta think if you want to grow, well, all your, all your lights got to be green. You can't have a check engine light somewhere because the body is very efficient. And if something is pulling, then something else has to take the slack. Something else is going to occur. And then it's just going to be a snowball. 
right? So me, I always suffer from, uh, we're not right now, I've been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. So I've destroyed my kidneys over the years. And because of this, I've also have liver issues. And I kind of find that the two are kind of like tit and tat. And, you know, if I take something it stresses the liver, well, then the kidneys, kidney enzyme goes up. And if the kidneys are shit, then the liver tends to have to pick up slack. And, um, you know, all this kind of stuff transfers. And then if you don't think that the heart is going to end up dealing with something, something, who knows, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of key things. And if you're not taking care of yourself, well, then you know, you're going to be, no one is going to do it for you. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to finish this race really, really fast. And I remember a saying that Dorian Yates actually posted very awesome that he came out and said it. And he, he made a, made a post on his Instagram and he says to all the young bodybuilders out there, I just want to let you know that there is a long life after bodybuilding. And it's so true because Dorian has been retired for, I don't know how many years he retired in what 96, I think it was, or 95, or I'm not sure, but you know, he's still plugging away. He's doing yoga. He's changed his entire life, smoked some pot, whatever he's living, he's doing what he wants to do, but you know, he didn't risk it all, or he saw that something was coming and you, you start to see, so start paying attention to who these people are who are retiring and start looking at like, why, why are you retiring? Why are you taking the time off? And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there's health reasons. Like, uh, what's his name? Lerowitz. What's that guy? He's from Australia. Oh, oh Josh uh, Lenartowitz. Lenartowitz. There you yeah. go. Yeah. You know, he, he was, he was doing some kind of stuff for, um, I guess, testing. I'm not sure really what his issue was and if he's going to come about and maybe he is honest and it was really nothing, but I know he's got a, I think he had, he had a child on the way or there, there was a baby or something. Um, either way, I, you know, you got to look at these things and they don't come back. Evan sent to Pawnee, he had his children. You realize right away, holy shit, I have to stay alive. I can't, I can't just die at, at 35 anymore. I have these little, these little kids. Um, and you know, maybe kids is the, <laughs> maybe kids is, is the retirement plan right there, because as soon as you have them for real, you know, Flex, Flex uh, Lewis seems to keep going. Um, he's got his little one, but I guarantee you at the first sign that there's a problem, yeah, it's not worth it, you know? So if you take care of your system, you can be a Dexter Jackson. There's no way around it. You know, obviously genetics play a role. Right? If you're going to have like an iron set of kidneys and an iron uh, liver and you're going to have a long lasting uh, career in, in bodybuilding and you can take stuff and the body doesn't care and let's go and all right, cool. But not everybody is like that. But if you take, if you take good care of it, you, you pace yourself, you take your time off. Yeah. You, you definitely, you can have a really good career doing, doing this sport. So. Fair enough. Awesome. Um, sorry. Do you have a question? Bro? I was going to say, um, Unless you have still a question regarding him as an athlete or, or as a coach, um, we've spoken about you in those aspects. I would like to move on to uh, you as a promoter. Okay. Um, what, how did you get into the, prom like now you have four shows. Uh, you have the natural VDC in, here in Manitoba, the Bandai Classic, the Open Regional here as well. You have one in Montreal. Or is yeah, uh, Gatineau. So it's called the Go Classic. That is the Go Classic, and now you have another show uh, promoting this show in June twenty, uh, June nineteen of this yeah. year in Cancun, Mexico. Yeah, don't feel bad. You you only have one show to remember. I got four, so I've screwed them up on the last podcast. I was getting all the dates wrong, but yeah, June, <laughs> June nineteen. I think I was saying the eighteen. I was all over the place. I couldn't remember. But yeah, that's that's with you. So we're we're gonna hit it. What was your question? You want to know how come I went promoting? Yeah. So what, uh, how did it start? How do you get into, how, how were you, I guess, allowed to hold these shows from, uh, by the CPA? Uh, well, at first, actually, I wanted to, to put my hand into promoting back when uh, Mava was still around and um, they were having their fall show because Blair, I'm, I'm good friends with Blair and he was the president. So I was asking Blair or maybe he was the vice president. I think Mike, maybe Mike, uh, Mike Janik was still the president at the time. Um, but I was asking if I could be the promoter of the fall classic, because I had some different ideas of what I wanted to do and how I wanted to present the show. And, and it was a smaller show. So it wasn't like I was going to give up any, any money for, from them. And I was going to pay them like a, a sanction fee. So I'm like, I'll pay you guys. 
and MABA was a nonprofit anyway. So really it didn't matter, right? It's not like it was money in their pockets. So it was less work for them, in my opinion. And I was just going to get my feet wet and try to host a show. So, but that didn't pan out for whatever reason that, that there was. Um, but when the separation between the CBBF and the CPA was coming right away, I reached out to Blair. I said, okay, we got to get on this, on this train. Let's, uh, let's reach out to Ron. Let's, let's get a show in, uh, in Winnipeg with the CPA. So, you know, Ron, uh, Ron agreed, uh, obviously, cause he didn't know me through a hole in the ground, but, um, <clears throat> when, uh, when he found out that Blair who was running MABA was, was going to come come jump aboard now that's a that's a whole different can of worms because there was issues between MABA and and the cpa and you know blair was kind of like this uh this in between didn't you know was kind of like helping me but still part of MABA. didn't want to leave them but wanted to make sure i had my show so it was, it was catch 22 right so it caused it caused some problems but we managed to get that first show off the road because blair was the uh, the promoter um and i was kind of like that co-promoter guy because again ron you know, didn't know me and I was still living in Quebec. So he's like, I can't, I can't have a guy from Quebec who's going to run a show in Manitoba. Like how's this going to happen? Right. Um, so we managed to get the first show underway. And as the second show was coming, there is uh, there were still issues between MABA and then the CPA. Ron didn't care, but there was issues, I guess, with and, and Blair just didn't want the, the drama anymore. And it, initially he just wanted me to have my show. So he, he stepped out. So then I, I became the sole promoter. And that year there was, um, you know, the natural shows, there was no promoter in Winnipeg that, um, that was taking it. I think he, he was trying to have a, uh, a second promoter in the city because he, he wanted to kind of like spread it around get different promoters. Um, but it didn't pan out. And I'm like, listen, let me have the one natural show in 2019. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you don't want me to have it after that, but at least let's just get one in the books to get it going. So that's how I ended up with my second show. And then, you know, now I'm doing pretty well. So I guess he's going to hopefully let me keep both of them. Um, so, but yeah, I, I managed to put the two shows together last year. And last year I, I spoke with another co-promoter in Gatineau, Jean-Jacques. So we decided to do a show together in, Gat in Gatineau, which is really close to Ottawa. And then Humberto, well, you know the story, but for the people who don't, uh, you know, Humberto, he reached out to the NPC wanting to do a show in Cancun, you know, and NPC won because of the, um, I guess the, well, I, you can explain it, Humberto, you're on here, go tell the people, <laughs> so you know. Well, and I am originally from Cancun, Mexico, and I've, I've even done two competitions there, and, uh, and after competing in Canada, knowing and realizing how the shows are run here, uh, there was just no comparison. The shows in Mexico still, there's, they're still, they're very, they're very, oh man, I can't find another word, but ghetto. Like, it's just basically, you, you, there's no backstage. There's, you're pumping right next to your parents. Like, it's just, they're, they're helping you like finish your tan. There's no tanning service. There's no official photographer. The weigh-in is so disorganized. Just to put it into perspective, like last time I competed, over there it was like uh i guess a provincial championship and did you win i i'll get i'll get to that <laughs> no you i better you better have won <laughs> no yes, so not, basically the weigh-in wasn't even a weigh-in they, they didn't even <laughs> have a, a scale they just basically took a look at you and they're like uh you'll be in this class and then they'll look at you like so if you wanted to register in the open they also had the novice and true novices uh, uh, i guess the equivalents they, you can go and you, you will be like, I want to do bodybuilding in the open. They're like, uh, they look at you like, no, you're going to be a novice. So they didn't even give you the, the opportunity to just at least see for yourself. <laughs> Would you it. imagine if we were allowed, if we could do that in our show? Holy shit. Yeah. Was so it was, it was, it was completely Sorry, dude, you need more work. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did to my sister too. Like she, she oh, yeah, wanted yeah. to be open in bikini and then, um, and then they took a look at her and said, no, you're going to be in the novice instead of the true novice, I guess. But the other thing, too, is that it's very complicated in the sense that you will have a guy that is a coach, that is the president of the association, that is also a judge. So there's a lot of, like, you know, conflict of interest in that, in that regard. And, you know, a lot of people know and talk and they know that this is the reality. But as of, 
as of now, that was that up until now, that was the only option they had for associations, right? So my goal was to bring uh, my hometown uh, another option, another opportunity for them to see what a really good show could could be. You know, having a backstage, having a tanning company, having a, an actual registration and weighing, not just someone telling you where you should. They're judging you before they even judge you, which is completely unfair in my opinion. So uh, yeah, basically, I reached out to. Uh, Robin Chang, um, and basically, his quite, I, I asked him, "What would it take for me to uh, be able to bring an NPC show to Cancun, Mexico?" Right now, there's the, the NPC hasn't really entered Mexico. His first question is, "Okay, what's your promoting experience?" So back then, it was fuck all. It was nothing. I had I was just an athlete, a coach, um, and then once you started promoting, I just kind of had the idea. Maybe I'll I'll reach out to Ryan to see if he has any interest in prom promoting a show in Mexico. And I use that as leverage to kind of reach back to them. I said, well, I have partnered up with Ryan Malu, who is um, a, a successful promoter. He has two shows, uh, about to have a third show. So I guess Ron Hash, uh, Robin asked Ron Hash, who is the president, by the way, of the Canadian Physique Alliance, which is the... Uh, oh, it was, it was Tyler. It went right to the top. Oh, did it? Uh, yeah, Ron was saying, yeah, Tyler, Tyler messaged me asking who you were. So he's like, I gave him good feedback. Don't let me down. I'm like, oh, I won't. <laughs> Dude, I'll do our best. No That's, a lot of pre That's a lot of pressure, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, no kidding. So yeah, basically, yeah, they gave us the green light and then we started promoting. It was supposed to happen for the first time last year, but of course, last year being pretty hectic, we were supposed to hold it in July. And then, uh, you know, with the whole COVID thing happening, we had to postpone it to this year. Uh, which kind of brings me to my to my next point. You still went through after moving uh, your shows multiple dates. Um, you still was you were still able to 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 go through with the shows last year uh, and hold it in October. The, your two regionals on the same same day. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what what went down the entire year about with these shows and and you know leading up to the date and making it happen because there was a lot of obstacles from what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I went through this on that promoter's corner. So I'm not trying to take away your views, but if you get a chance, I posted it on my Facebook and stuff, the promoter's corner. So I'll go, I, I'll go really, really quick with this one because it's in more in depth and that's where I, I talked way too much, but uh, basically, yeah. So, so last year there was a lot of things that kind of like pushed it. I had to push the, the VDC natural back because obviously that's when COVID first hit. So everything was shut, pushed it to the May event, put the two together then with everything happening and things were still shut, I'm like, forget it. We're going to push it back even further. So I pushed it into, I don't even know. I think at one point I had it in September and then another point that lasted for a week, I think. And then I moved it to October. Um, and, you know, I think it was even October, it was uh, still scheduled at the event center at the casino. Um, but moving closer to this with all the rules and all the regulations and stuff, the casino didn't want to open uh, just because they, they don't open for a small capacity. They, they want to make sure that they have a big enough crowd to impact the casino. So for them, it wasn't worth it. Uh, so I was originally just going to have it in the Transcona, uh, Transcona Inn in the basement. I was just going to, you know, see what I could do because the, um, the capacity was 50 people. So I'm like, hey, screw it. I'm just going to do no audience and see what I can do with maybe a live stream or something. Uh, maybe just throw it up on Instagram and, you know, bite the bullet and that's it. So once that 50 people, I was, uh, you know, I, I was I was on my way to the airport still thinking like this. And I had to go two weeks before because I had to quarantine because I was coming from Quebec. So in Manitoba, anyone out east had to quarantine. So I'm, I'm planning to come. I'm at the airport. I get a call from the health inspectors and say, hey, listen, you know, you, you probably can't do your show. We're going to shut, shut it down from a capacity of 50 down to 10. So I'm like, holy crap, man. Is this going to affect my venue? They weren't sure. So I'm like, well, I'm at the airport. Do I fly? Do I not fly? I don't want to sit in Winnipeg in quarantine when I can't even do a show. I'm like, if they're flat out telling me I can't do it, then I'm just going to stay home. And, you know, I threw my, uh, I threw my prayers to God and, and, um, you know, something, something brought me to Winnipeg still. So I, I went there sure enough on Monday, I got the information. Okay. Could only have 10 scrambled like crazy. Uh, long story short, ended up coming across, uh, a guy by the name of Martin who controls the Centennial concert hall. We went through some talking. Yep. No problem. I can take care of your event. We're going to have to schedule it, but we're 90 minute increments. Um, this is probably the biggest thing that maybe a lot of people don't know is that I did have to keep it to 90 minutes. I wasn't allowed to go over 90 minutes. 
Um, I've never tried to do a show in 90 minutes. So I had zero idea how fast and how quick I would have to go um, until the very first one. So that first 90 minute slot when I was at the convention center or sorry, the, the Centennial Concert Hall, man, I was stressed. We had a new head judge, uh, Natalie. So she was like, you know, her pace, she wasn't quite you know, familiar with how fast we had to go. I'm freaking out backstage. The men's bodybuilders, like just going from the the novice, true novice, masters, grandmasters, and stuff like that, took way too long. We were almost 30 minutes just with that. So that's why, like backstage, you know, I had to, again, I was freaking. I, I was just gonna walk out of the whole thing and just leave. I, I was so stressed. I, th I thought I was gonna. Pee. I didn't even eat for two days. Um, dealing with everything, trying not, you know, be with the day before trying to schedule times. And then, you know, the tanning times come in and then I got like 20 people. I got to reschedule, you know, to try to keep everything on tack because I only could have 10 people for registration, which means I had three volunteers. I had to only schedule everything in seven groups of seven. So you have like multiple, it was, it was hell trying to get that anyways long story short through through it to god he, he helped me through it the the men were amazing to give up their posing routines and to give up their 30 second walkout i had no choice i had to push the, the show so fast that they allowed me to bring them out as a uh, as a group compulsory pose then they did a pose down and then we did first second or second or third second and first and then that was it that was their amount of time on stage i'm for real, I'm, maybe they spent two minutes, maybe three. And I really commend them on not uh, freaking out as I thought that they would. I'm sure some were disappointed. Um, maybe the judging was a little bit rushed based on the fact that we had to rush the show. And I apologize for a lot of this kind of stuff. But moving forward, the next 90 minutes and the next 90 minutes, like for the for the natural, everything was at a better pace. Again, we still had to speed everything. So, you know, for a lot of novice people, it was the first time on stage. Their experience was complete horror. Um, and, and, you know, but it was either that or I would have canceled the show. So I, I literally had no idea. And I was still debating canceling the show two days before it. You know, that's how I was really working with this 90 minutes. I'm like, how am I going to do this? You know, it's impossible. And uh, yeah, we, we, we squeaked it through. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. This year, moving in to 2021, I know a lot more. Um, I have a lot more options. Um, again, we have the event center, but I have backup places on hold. So there's, there's options on both sides. So whether I have to run it with no audience and do a live stream, I can, if I have to run it, hopefully, you know, 25 people is like the least, if it goes below 25, it's going to be really stressful. Um, unless I can go back to the Centennial concert hall, which I also have on hold. So there's, that's the option. Um, I was lucky with them because they actually still are, were allowed 30% capacity, which gave me 500 people I could have in the audience. It's just unfortunate. I was so stressed, so scared that my show was going to shut down um, I didn't advertise the tickets like I should have. So that was something that I'm going to correct hopefully through this year. And uh, yeah, if I have to book four slots for 90 minutes, I know how to schedule things a little bit differently, right? So instead of trying to cram all the men for the open in 90 minutes, I'd break it down bodybuilding, um, maybe in classic or bodybuilding in men's physique for 90 minutes and then move to classic with say a couple women's classes and then we have another you know so on and so forth and I try to plan it that way but we're going to do both shows the open and the natural and uh, I'll do whatever it takes if I have to push it I'll push it so right now gyms are open they're open at 25 capacity so hopefully everything stays like this I don't want to push it um, but I want to give you guys a show so if that requires me to move my date then hopefully everybody understands that um, the only show that's really keeping me in place is the natural nationals that I want to stay in front of that show so that everybody who do, does the VDC natural has an opportunity to actually go to the national nationals, um, in Toronto because they qualify for it. If I move my show past this, it's going to force them out of town and I don't want to do that. So that's why I'm staying. So for right now, we're, we're pretty good. Well, that's good, man. I think a lot of people are extremely grateful that uh, regardless of the way um, the show panned out and how it was slightly rushed, obviously, uh, that they were just able to step on stage. Like, I know myself, I was just grateful 
But I think the biggest anxiety for anyone who was prepping for that show was that uh, that it could have been canceled at any minute. So thank you regardless for pushing through and putting it on for all of us. I'm sure we all really appreciate it. I know I do. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are super excited to see how it pans out uh, for the rest of the year. But uh, we do have some questions. We got about 20 minutes left. Let's uh, move on to the next section. Next sure. section of things. Yeah, you guys are okay. yeah. Actually, at three at three o'clock, I got a I got a call from uh, Elena Popoff. You know who she is? Wind yeah, I saw you. yeah. So I got I got a call with her at three. So that's well, that's two your time. So we'll finish before that one. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep everybody up to date on what's going on with that. So I'm trying to work something out with this. It'll be good for the women's female bodybuilding, definitely. So we'll see. nice. Anyways, what are the questions? What do we got? Uh, this one we'll leave to you because uh basically the questions are for you versus all of us weighing in. So okay. when it comes, yeah, when it comes to hypertrophy, do reps necessarily matter if you max out or fatigue effectively slash properly in 10 reps? Does it really make a difference? In 10 reps versus what? What are you, what are you talking about? Hold on a second. Let me, let, me re, let me hear that question again. So when it comes to hypertrophy, do reps necessarily matter if you max out? And then in brackets, it says, or fatigue effectively slash properly in 10 reps, 10, 12, or 15 reps. Does it really make that much of a difference as long as you're maxing out? I don't know. You guys understand that question? Because it seems like it's a two-part question. It's kind of like a two-parter. This yeah, is from, uh, is, he talking like, is he talking about, this is from who? Uh, sorry. It's one from one of Humberto's clients there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cause I want to know, is, are they talking about pre-fatiguing and then going to a max, max weight, or are they talking about using what a max I get from the question? I think what this person is asking is for hypertrophy purposes, do you believe that there is a specific rep range that works best than rather than others, whether it's lower rep range, higher rep range, or somewhere in the middle? Ah, for, for that kind of stuff, honestly, it is really going to depend on everybody's different, right? Depends on um, your fast twitch and slow twitch and which, which way you're going to respond to, right? So it's, it's trial and error. Um, science forever has been trying to figure out this sport and I laugh at it. I'm sure we've learned a lot more. We understand what's kind of happening. Um, but when you try to basically contain and and put a, a bubble around okay this is what works and this is what doesn't work this is where you're going to run into problems i think the best is to kind of play around with both and i really like um i do with my clients right now i'm, I'm using a lot of push pull leg and i do a um a heavy and um uh, like a more of a heavy set at the beginning or a heavy workout monday tuesday wednesday and then I move more into hyper, uh, hypertrophy, hypertrophy, or how do you say the word? Hypertrophy. Uh, hypertrophy. hypertrophy yeah, yeah, I can't say that right now. Uh, I move into that more later on in the week. So example, but it, it's, it's a buildup. So what I end up doing is I, I try to, if they can train six days a week, this works perfect. Um, so I kind of believe in using both, both methods and you, you build your strength and you build your, your muscle density or your density with, with your heavy weight. And then you're going to help shape and build size with your higher reps. So it's kind of like a, um, I guess an eight week program I use. So for the first two weeks, I'll put it, put it at like say 12 and 12. So, you know, you're going to pick more compound movements the first part of the week, and you're going to pick more shaping isolation move. It's the second part of the week. Um, you do that for two weeks, the second two weeks, I move more down to uh, a 10 and a 14. And then two weeks after that, I'm going to move to an eight and a 16. And two weeks after that, I would move down to a six and an 18. And you're slowly, what, what you're doing is you're actually bringing your weight up and you're bringing your reps down, which is allowing you to lift more. So you're actually, um, you're, you're learning how to control heavy weight. You're still not doing a one, one rep max. So the, you know, the injury, the injury aspect, you're not really going to blow it out on one. It, it, you know, you're still trying to lift a, a decent amount for six. If you can lift, if you can lift heavy for six reps, um, it's still not close to your max. Right. So, um, and then the other second half, I would actually be going more for the hypertrophy and higher reps just to blow out the muscle, to train it a second time and then actually get the, the shaping and the isolation and the pump. And this is what you're focusing on. 
Um, that's one method. The other method is, a, you know, I've seen people increase. So they do, instead of drop sets, they do like sets where they increase, um, where they, they gradually grab heavier and heavier and they do like kind of like a giant set moving their way up, right. Or moving their way down. Honestly, you really got to play around and see what works in the end. I believe that isolation is always going to trump um, on most of it. Uh, you can do your compound movements, and those are very good for dense building, like bench press, your squats, deadlifting. Um, you're going to do your, you know, like pull-ups, awesome for, for your back. But you, you can't neglect the, uh, the isolation stuff if you are competing in a sport such as ours. I've seen a lot of people who come in there and who have – awesome deadlifts, awesome squats, awesome bench presses and stuff like this, but their shape is not correct. So it really depends on what you're looking for. What is your shape? What do you, what, what's your end game? What is your goal? Are you trying to fix your shape? Or are you just trying to get stronger? Um, this is, this is the big thing, but in the, in bodybuilding, I would go reps over heavy weight anytime. If you can do reps with heavy weight, now you become into a different realm where you're moving more towards understanding um, how to actually use tension versus activation. And you're going to, you know, you're on your way to becoming a pro. And that's the key is if you can understand tension versus activation, you will see how fast your strength will actually increase and your rep range will actually increase with that heavy weight and you'll be doing it properly. I don't know. I don't know if that's answering the question or if I'm just kind of dancing. That's, you know what? It's uh, it's a, uh... I've thought about this question actually before it's even asked to me uh, multiple multiple occasions and what I've come the conclusion that I've come to is is the following and it's it's a very similar answer to to what you were just saying um, the two main things that in my opinion uh, are to be taken into consideration for hypertrophy the most one is the length of a set and by this I mean how long you are under tension within set. Uh, because this is going to play in what could, could potentially be too low rep. Uh, in my opinion and personal experience, a set that is too short, meaning you do a one rep max, two rep max, you will potentially gain strength from that approach. But I don't believe that there's a lot, a whole of a whole lot of hypertrophy happening, not up until right around the five rep range minimum, in my opinion and experience and, you know, experience with clients as well. So this is something that generally if you're controlling well enough would be a long enough set that would spur some hypertrophy. The other thing is how aware you are with a specific muscle group. So for example, when I prescribe a, 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 a training program for cert certain muscle groups that are trickier and smaller, for example, a, a your posterior delt, your rear delts, it is such a small muscle group that is surrounded by very strong and big supporting muscle groups, meaning your traps and your lats. When you do those movements, like a reverse fly, it's very easy for someone to engage their traps or their lats for, or for them to take over, uh, over the, the smaller muscle group that you're trying to target, meaning being the, the rear delt. So I like to prescribe a longer, like a higher rep range, something like somewhere between 12 and sometimes even 20. Why? because it will force the person to not go as heavy and the set is going to be long enough that a lot of that set is going to hopefully target that small muscle group so it's almost like a shotgun approach to the set like you're doing so many reps here for so long that it will be more likely that you engage that muscle group rather than if i put you on a six to eight rep range because you're likely going to go heavier than you than your rear delt can handle and your traps and your, your lats are probably going to take over. So body awareness, if you were a complete master in body awareness and you were your connection with that rear delt was 100%, which in reality, 99% of people don't have that, that, that strong enough body awareness, you would probably do it in less. But it's one of those muscle groups that if you actually take a look at the shoulder of mo most guys or even girls, your front delt is overdeveloped in comparison, then probably the me uh, middle delt follows. And then the rear delt is a, it's, it's a, an often either neglected or lagging muscle group. So most people are not really fully connected and comfortable with that movement. So, so those are the couple of things that I would take into consideration. I think you can grow muscle 
uh, at, at both ends of the spectrum when it comes to rep range, both the higher rep range and the low rep range. But I personally, if I had a choice between the two, I would go with the lower because lifting heavier is just that much more fun. You just you just made Byron yawn. <laughs> See, maybe maybe like a maybe like a little bit. Yeah, he's maybe like, "Oh, this is fucking All right, let's, 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 we got we got like eight minutes. Let's fire through some questions here. Let's see. All right, I got I got a spicier one here. Um, right. and just be completely blunt. Do you feel that HGH and insulin are a requirement if you actually want to be successful at the high end of the national slash beginning of pro levels? Uh, depends on genetics. Fair. Well, let's, yeah. let's, okay. So let me, let me cut it, cut it down a little bit then take out the Keons, uh, the people like Kai Green who turned pro being natural. Cause those guys are like the unicorns of bodybuilding in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the average person, the average person who let's say, you know, maybe they win an overall, but they go to nationals and they get second call out. Do you think it's necessary for them? No. If you got, if you got second call out and there's something missing, and it's not GH and insulin. So what's missing is uh, spend a little bit, spend a little bit more time on your craft, get your get your dieting right, um, get your posing right. Because because nine times out of ten, if you place out of there, you're you know, and if you have an okay physique, it's your posing that's really gonna shoot you in the foot. Um, because uh, yeah, that second call out is 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 based on like the judge's uh, opinion of you within that first thirty seconds. So if your posing sucked. You know, you're allowed to pose however you want to pose based on your physique. You don't have to show them all your poses. You don't have to show them, you know, nothing. You can just show them what you want them to see. So that's what a lot of people even still don't know is that that 30 seconds, it's not like how it is at the pros where you got to go through every single compulsory pose. No, we're allowed to show whatever we want. If you want to show them this and you want to do this and you feel that that's enough and you want to wave and walk off, they don't care. If they think you're impressive enough to be in that first call out, you'll be in that first call out. So uh, if you're relying on GH and insulin, nah. chances are if you're at that level, you're probably just going to abuse it. You're probably going to overuse it and you probably don't know how to use it. And it's going to do more damage than anything. Right. So, again, um, I would lean more towards, you know, master your craft, get back to the basics, find out judges feedback and and go that route because there's so much other things you can utilize before that do i think gh is an awesome tool yeah i like it um do i use it on athletes sure if they can afford it if they if they're able to to obtain it sure no problem uh insulin is something that i'll only give to people that i know who can follow direction because it's a dangerous product um i remember when i was first starting out again there was no youtube there's no i had no coaches it was just basic crap and I was playing with insulin and shit. I and mean, I almost killed myself a few times where, well, you know, like, if you're not a diabetic, you really can't, you have to take a lot to kill yourself with insulin, but you can, you can definitely black out, pass out. Um, your body has natural defenses that will kind of kick in to keep you alive. So it's, it, it's scary, but it's not like how most people put it as. Um, if you're a diabetic and you're pissing around with insulin, okay, well now your defenses are no longer there. Your, your body can't you know, rebound from taking too much or not having any and this kind of stuff. So there, that's a different story altogether, but for people who are generally healthy, but there's a certain way to use it. And, you know, even me, I, I'm still learning better ways to, to use it and how, how to kind of make it work to its advantages and stuff. It's a powerful substance, but it needs to be respected. Fair enough. Um, I have two last questions. So if you want to, make them quick answers i know you're on a time limit here for your next yeah, no yeah if i get the phone call i'm gonna be like peace i'm out <laughs> no problem then that's fine okay yeah. first first one i got is what goes into choosing the winner of the uh, mass meltdown x factor award uh that one i leave up to the judges okay because and the, and the only reason why i feel it's fair is because i can't watch the entire show as a promoter um i'm also the owner of mass meltdown so it's my award i created this award the reason why i created this award is because i feel that there's a lot of athletes um this this actually was started back in the day where you know we didn't have all the the men's physique we didn't have um classic we didn't have women's uh wellness women's um physique categories right so you know, some of these people that you're seeing had phenomenal, phenomenal shapes and they just happened to be in the wrong class. 
And, you know, I'm like, that's, that's such a shame because they're like the best in the entire show. So you see, you see a lot of these, these types of things. And especially now, so say you have like a woman's uh, wellness who just shows up and she looks like a, a chick who, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say, uh, looks like a girl, sorry, who, um, woman. Anyway, I'm getting all these things in my head here. Yeah. Correction. No, no, politically correct. <laughs> She, but she looks like someone who should be in either women's physique or women's bodybuilding and she would win for sure for sure she didn't want to do that she wanted to wear the heels she wanted to have the makeup she wanted to do the hair and she wanted to do the turns so she chose women's wellness but she was the most phenomenal person in the entire show this is an award for somebody like this somebody who shows up has cerebral palsy uh decides to go on stage it's not a boohoo story, not a, not a, um, you know, an iron will award or nothing like that. It's on this day, this person overcame something and they're on stage with either one leg, with a walker, with cerebral palsy, with uh, anything. And they overcame whatever it took to show up that day. So it's a big difference. It's not like an iron will where somebody lost like 400 pounds and showed up. No, because I'm looking at them on stage and if they have a lot of loose skin, well, they, it's, I don't understand the story, right? And neither will the rest of the group. You see somebody come out on a wheelchair, decide to stand up and pose or come out there with some, you know, or didn't fit the class and, but just was so phenomenal. And when, when you walk into the lobby, everyone's like, I don't understand how come she didn't win. She looked phenomenal. Well, she, she was too ripped for the class or he was too big for this class or whatever. Right. It just didn't, it didn't matter. This is the mass meltdown X factor award. Um, sometimes these types of uh, athletes don't show themselves at the show. Cause it's not every show that you're going to have like people who have to overcome or people who don't. So then at that point, the judges are left to feel who has huge potential based on what they showed on the stage that day. So um, Sean Edwards uh, won it last time. So according to the judges, they felt that he showed potential. I agree. Um, I didn't see every single athlete, so I can't say that he would have been my choice. I, I applaud the choice and I agree with the choice because I didn't watch the show. But these types of people show huge promise. So when you look at them, can this person become a pro? Can they increase? Can they um, you know, maybe they didn't place well, but shit, man, you get your things together and you're, you, you're well on your way. This is, this could be an award for you. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Uh, before I ask the last question, Ryan, uh, well, actually we don't have time to wait for the last question. Um, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Shoot it. I'm going to call you. Let's go. What's the question? Okay. Last question. Um, who do you feel shows the most promise out of our province right now? Who's still competing? Oh shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, gotta, honestly and this and this is this is probably one of the things that makes me a successful promoter is the fact that i'm so distant from what's going on there i don't play favorites i have no favorites i don't pick favorite coaches i don't pick favorite teams sorry humberto um but it's it's true and i feel that if i was a promoter living in winnipeg i would be stuck with the stigma of like, well, I don't want to do Ryan's show because no, 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 no. And I'm a personal trainer too, right? So I might have athletes in my own show. Can you imagine how crazy that would be? That's horrible. Yeah, it's called Mexico. Yeah, well, there you go. And I don't want, I don't want to go that route. Now, there might be a few years where some of my clients actually want to come to my show, but I have no control over what the judges do and I let them do whatever they want to do. But the fact that I'm very distant from there, I feel, you know, um, I'm kind of separated and nobody knows who I am really excited aside from being a promoter, which is awesome. There's a new group of people coming up. Maybe they're going to learn a few things about me through this podcast, which is awesome. But as far as they know, I'm a promoter. I put on the VDC, the, the Van Dyke classic. Um, hopefully they like my shows. Hopefully they want to do my shows. And if they have any questions, I will help anybody out. And I'm hundred percent for the athletes. I've never been somebody who is just in it for the money. Um, not in it to lose money, but I, I would like, you know, I, I want to put on a good show so that, uh, that the athletes get what they can, can get out of it. And that's, that's what I pride myself on. So picking a favorite who has potential, honestly, I have, I have zero clue on what's going on. Um, I'm just trying to hang on by a thread <laughs> and get no this worries. show to go. Yeah. People ask the questions and we just, uh, pass them on. But yeah. Was there any other questions? That was it. I don't know. 
Well, no, no, we're about to we're we're pretty much out of time before it stops okay, recording go. here. But I just want you to say uh, thank thank you very much for joining us, Ryan. Can we possibly get you on in the future before the VDC? Yeah, no problem. Anytime you guys want to do stuff, um, I'm good to go. If people enjoyed what I had to say, if they have follow up questions, definitely I'm I'm willing to touch more on that. I didn't get a chance to go too too much into the health aspect. Um, I would like to actually cover that because I feel that that's probably the most important thing talking about like, you know, what to look for in blood work. Um, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't know crazy medical terms. I like to talk in layman terms because I'm, I, you know, I keep things as simple as I can, but uh, definitely health is, is the biggest thing. If I can be an advocate for helping people from destroying their kidneys Again, I didn't even go into my own story of like my health problems, what I encountered. And there's there's a lot like, you know, we didn't touch on the athletic club of what happened there. We didn't touch on being hospitalized in 2012 where I was in for 10 days and kidneys almost toast. And we didn't, you know, we didn't touch on like the torn chest, the, the busting of my quadricep, uh, the teardrop and, you know, just just playing safe and being being smart in what you're doing. It's uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, so I got a lot of crap to share. And hopefully people don't fall down the same path well to tell you what we can do um uh, let us know what your availability is maybe we could film a second part to this uh in the next coming weeks and and actually focus on the health aspects and everything you've gone through yeah definitely because i'd like to actually even get other people on here to see what kind of health questions and if there's other coaches and stuff i man just to shoot and see what other people do honestly i don't know if if you guys we, we uh we got we got um, Paul Lawson coming up here in a couple of weeks on the twenty second of March. Uh, Fuad's training partner, actually. Okay. Um, so maybe a lot of that crap be- might be over my head because these guys like like, like the spit terms, um, you know. So all these terminologies it sounds smart, but I keep it so simple. I keep it so simple. Just don't be a retard. You know, oh, it would just- be a nice contrast from like the very very. Like, yeah, you know, it, I'd you know. probably learn something. So I'd be cool. I, I'm cool to like sit back and listen. And I, I'd, I'd probably have a lot of questions myself. I'm, I'm cool with it if you want to sit. If Humberto's fine with it, I'm cool with it if you want to sit on that episode. That's March 22nd. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good with it. I'm, I'd be curious to see. And I, I'd have a lot, of, a lot of questions asked. All right. Well, uh, 7 p.m. on March 22nd. Make yourself available and we'll make it happen. Cool. What day of the week is that? Monday. Monday. Always Monday. We okay. always do it on the Mondays. Okay, at 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. Okay, I'll have to see if my daughter has danced. You might see her dancing in the background, but that's okay. Even if you just want to meet yourself and hang out on the episode. but uh, (laughs) That's cool. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for the time. Um, Anything you want to plug or promote? No, no, we're we're good. We'll leave it at this, but thank you so much for having me on. And uh, if there's anything anybody wants to know, they can reach me on uh, Instagram for the shows or or even if you have a question about whatever you, you heard here, if you want to know more. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care. How do I fucking close this? <laughs> I'm so going to turn that into a meme. <laughs> Thank you.